So, yeah, but probably if you are coming from Spain or Latin America, uh, everybody knows about us at the time. Uh, we are uh, we started as a as a ride hailing company. We are diversifying our uh, offer into other mobility offers and and servi local services offer. Uh, yeah, and what not everybody knows about us, and I can tell you without getting fired, is that we play in the most competitive industry in the world, and the metric for that would be the billions that venture capital has funneled into this, uh, into this industry. Uh, <clears throat> just to give you an idea, we are a unicorn, but our biggest top uh, competitors in Latin America are 50 times bigger than us. So I don't think that happens <laughs> in, many, in many industries. And just also to give you an idea, idea of how, how competitive the landscape is, is that, for example, our drivers in Brazil are not only uh, driving for Cabify, but they are actually working with three phones. In one of them, they have Cabify. In, one of, in the other, they have Didi, the Chinese uh, ride-hailing giant. And in the other, they have Uber. So, so it's a like minute-by-minute minute battle to get the drivers and the riders, right? So I, I just wanted to emphasize the, the real-time component of the business because it will explain a lot about of what we are doing. Uh, all the tech we build it in Madrid and Sao Paulo in Brazil, um, and the. Um, And, and we, are, we are growing exponentially, we have been growing exponentially in, al almost from the very beginning, and we mean it, because uh, here we have a bunch of uh, data people. You will understand that if I do this on the, the logarith in the number of journeys, and it's on a straight line, that means we have been growing exponentially all over the, the lifespan on the, of the company. Um, and the cool thing when you get this kind of growth is that you can start understanding the cities where we operate by looking at, at our own data. Uh, yeah. So in this case, I am just uh, throwing points. There is no underneath, uh, underneath uh, map of drop-off locations in Madrid. And as you see, uh, the, the, the patterns of the main streets start to emerge. This is a park. This is uh, whatever. The, this is the Retiro Park. This is a highway. So obviously, for safety reasons, people do not drop off in, in the middle of the highway. And in, in general, you can understand how the city works just, just by looking at, at, your, at your own data, which is kind of cool. Uh, and the other thing that is really relevant in, in ride hailing and mobility as a service is that it's a non-mature industry, which means that for professionals like us, it's, it's relatively achievable to have huge impact with relatively simple solutions. Uh, just to give you a counter example, if you are optimizing the supply chain of an Airbus 380, yeah, you can do that, you can do that, and you can get some nice results with data, but probably you are looking at a problem that thousands of very smart people have been looking at during the past 30 years. While in ride hailing and mobility as a service, we are literally looking at, looking at problems that seven years ago just simply didn't exist, right? Because the, the, the thing wasn't, the, the industry wasn't here at all. So this is uh, one example of, uh, the data dog eyes are still over there? Yeah. <laughs> So I love the Itadoc because I start learning that every, we are all using it for something very different than what this one originally thought for. And in our case, as I explained to you, uh, we are a very real-time business. And what we have done is basically we are reporting the cars as if they were servers, right? And in there, you have like the blue are empty cars, the, the purple are with a passenger, and the yellow are going to pick up. Uh, this is how many units we have finished in per minute compared to before, or this is the success rate, which is the number of requests that we can actually attend. This is for a certain city. And, and the, the cool thing is like we're, we have given this to, to local uh, teams, 
And when, last time I was in Sao Paulo, three weeks ago, there was a, an entire row of computers for the operations team, and they were like added to this team because they are actually like triggering promotions for driver, as I told you, with the competing by the minute, and, and they are doing it based on the information that they have here. Also, when you have these kind of things, and you have, as I, as I said before, you can understand the city from your own data, you realize that you built something interesting. This is the graph that I saw before. This is uh, empty cars uh, going to pick up and with a passenger. Does anyone remember what happened in Mexico City in that day? There was an earthquake. And I can see in my data dog the precise minute when this happened, and 60% of the mobile coverage was down in the city. That, that's what we are seeing in there. So it's just by, <laughs> I built a seismographer without, <laughs> without being, without intending to. Uh, this is the entire point of my talk, so I will be repeating <laughs> quite some, uh, quite often. Uh, another thing that you can, we had a huge impact in the, in the data team, it was with the dynamic pricing. Uh, we decided to break it into two completely different parts. One is detecting scarcity, and this is something like a physics measurement, and this is how aggressive we want to be on the increasing and decreasing of the price. Because we learned over time that the price sensitivity is very different uh, for European users than from, that for Latin American users. Basically, in Latin America, the service is affordable enough that people can commute uh, with Cabify. In, as you can see, I mean, maybe you can commute in, in Cabi, uh, with Cabify in, in Madrid or Barcelona. You're lucky then. But in general, the price sensitivity is higher there because they are using it every day. So we, we decided to break it into two. And then uh, what we are doing, without going into much detail, is just we are simply checking how the, uh, the recent journeys were served and how long it took for us to find a driver. The cool thing is like we are doing this at scale. So this means that every minute we are uh, checking up to 50,000 recent journeys, and we are making a decision about in about 125,000 regions on the, on the Earth on what's the scarcity level, and then translating, translating that into the, into the price. And this is like a feedback loop. As you can imagine, if you raise the price too much, people would stop uh, requesting rights, and there, there wouldn't be a scarcity. So it's, it, there is no forecasting. This is just no casting with a, with a feedback loop. And, sorry, sorry. <laughs> and it works like a charm. Uh, this is the kind of hexagons that I, that I was uh, saying before, where we uh, decide to, uh, to make our decision. And this is, oh, the videos are playing funny today. Okay. Yeah. So this is, uh, we're still a startup in the core. So this is just to show you that uh, it took only 27 days for the algorithm to generate an additional uh, a million dollars for our drivers, considering that we launched the pilot project in Bogota in for November 14th, and we went full deploy only 25 days later. And that's what the, that animation is about. Uh, and as I said, it's, it, it has like super high impact. Yeah, just, to, just to give you an idea, we made a, a funny metric. Like imagine that if a driver is making 20% more because of the dynamic pricing, you can consider that he did 1.2 journeys, right? So that's the value that we produce it for him. He worked one journey, he got 1.2. Uh, so, if you use that metric, in the first week of full deploy, we generated like over 120,000 uh, journeys in value for the drivers, which roughly means that we, uh, we generated the value equivalent to 2.8 million kilometers and 100,000 hours a week. 
And as you said, I mean, I didn't go into the details, but probably people in this room can understand that it's not rocket science, anything of what we did. Maybe it is challenging to keep it at scale and, and that everything works smooth, but we, we didn't need to go too far into, into machine learning or stuff to, to generate high impact. Message of the talk. And the other, uh, the other exhibit is something related to the, to the previous talk. I think all right hailing people, especially the data scientists, we, we love this theme because it's when we see like we are like making people's lives better, right? When you can organize thousands of agents so that they are all more productive or get in, or can get better service, that, that's something very rewarding. Um, <clears throat> and it is what we build in the world. Uh, typical taxi drivers, uh, unless they are driving in Manhattan, that is like super high density, they are only busy 30% of their time. While we put technology in the equation, we can move those numbers up to 55, even 60% uh, nowadays. So yes, it means we can, by using tech, we can make people twice as productive, right? Uh, before there was a data beam, the matcher, it was like the MVP of the, of the matcher, was very simple, was just uh, calculating the distance with a straight line, like hover sign distance, uh, and there was some limitation on the radius, right? So I wouldn't uh, ask a driver to go to pick up for 20 kilometers, right? Th those were the, the two things. The problem with the radius is that they had to be set like very manually by operation teams and trying to gather many things from the, from the urban density, such as for the urban structure, such as density, uh, speed of the, of the streets, right? It's not the same if it is a highway that it is in the city center, or like they were trying to, to gather manually many, many insights in the system, and we end up with a, uh, with a system of over 1,000 manually written rules. And you can imagine that that's like impossible to test. Right? Like, how, how can I even remotely think of testing if one additional room, uh, rule is bringing any value? In, I don't have statistical power for that, despite the millions of journeys that, that we do. Um, and another uh, thing that has happened, I think, to every right hailing company in the beginning is that uh, when you have too much, uh, when demand exceeds supply, then it goes to, uh, to be what is named as the goose chasing, because it's like the drivers uh, are assigned very far, and then they try to get closer, but people cancel, and then the process repeats, and um, a bunch of time is, is lost. So what we did, and again, I mean, in here there is a little bit more complexity, but nothing crazy, is that instead of computing the bare distance, we were using ETA estimations. That's something. I will, uh, I will talk further. Yeah, I don't even know my own password. Um, uh, now we transfer from the radius in kilometers to an isochrome, that because we realized that local teams, 90% of what they were trying to mimic into the system was this idea of like, yeah, I don't want the driver to take more than five minutes to go to pick up. And, and if you do an isochrome, that isochrome is like uh, updates daily, I, I mean, in real time. So if the, if the traffic is bad, then the, the radius is closer. And many of the things that were like manually written, it can capture just by definition. Uh, and the other super cool thing is, the, is instead of going the greedy approach, like journey per journey, what we start doing uh, is using the Hungarian algorithm for the assignment problem, which is like a hundred year old math. It's, it's nothing crazy again. Uh, so basically what we were doing before is like depending on, on who was first ordering, we might be doing this assignment. So this is like the driver is going to pick up a, a rider in here, a, this in here. And obviously there is a smarter one, which is like, yeah, you, you can just go here and this guy will go here. And when you have two, it's obvious, but when you have 100 and 500, then it gets a bit more tricky and you need to, to tackle the problem, but it's still solvable in this case. 
uh, it has an exact solution. You don't need to, to do metaheuristics or crazy things. You, need to, you run into that when you want to do pooling, when you want to put more than one people at the same time in the same car. But we haven't got there yet. Uh, and again, simple idea, and here is the impact. It, it's, it's pretty cool how we tested the learning scheme, because uh, what we did is like every 13 minutes, uh, we, we would swap the matching system, right? And why 13 and not 15? Because we didn't want to have seasonality effects, because some things in cities uh, tend to happen like o'clock, right? And, and we want to, to uh, avoid that. Uh, so in general, what happened is like due to this uh, improvement, our pickup suddenly became 30 seconds faster on average. We're talking that our average pickup is between four and five minutes. Uh, that means that our drivers are saving 25,000 to 35,000 hours of work per week. And uh, they are driving 500,000 kilometers less to make the same money and provide the same value to the passengers, right? So that, again, simple solution, super high impact. Uh, but it has a catch. Right now, we are a gold mine for commercial route providers, this ETA calculation. We, we are requesting commercial APIs. And if you think about it, I, have a, I will explain that uh, later. But it, this doesn't scale well, because basically it scales with the square of the size of the business. And for some reason, our CFO is not happy about it, right? When your cost scales with the square of the business, you know. Um, and so we start challenging ourselves if we could be our own uh, ETA estimation system. And that's what I mean telling you now. The problem is simple. We need ETA. For example, uh, we, uh, you guys, at uh, this point, you all want to have, to have an ad from pricing, right? You want, before you hop in a car, you want to know that the ride will be $10.40. And, and you, want to keep, uh, you want us to keep that promise. So that means that if we are charging by the minute, which we do, at least a portion of the price, we have to make a prediction on how long the, the ride will be. Uh, obviously, to assign drivers and riders, this is the, by far the more intense, and this is what I was referring before, that is a quadratic problem. Uh, and also, another super interesting thing is like for making our matcher better, we need to simulate. And to simulate, we sometimes need to figure out how long would have it, take, would have it taken for a driver to take a path he didn't take. And a truly bad thing about commercial route providers is that they don't give you ETA estimations about the past. So, so in, in, in that we, we, we hit a roadblock. Like, yes, uh, either we figure something out ourselves or, or we cannot uh, use the simulation, which as you can imagine, uh, it helps us a lot because yes, we can do experiments, but with experiments, we cannot fine tune the parameters of the things. We need simulations for that. Um, so the objective is super simple. Every five seconds, each of our drivers is telling us where he is and what he's doing and in which direction he's moving. Uh, so we have a bunch of data about that. We don't have any map. Maps are like super expensive. Maybe some of our competitors can afford like a billion dollar map division. We cannot. Uh, and another interesting thing for the machine learning problem is like for a certain journey from A to B in training time, you can have the trajectory, but in evaluation time, you won't, you won't know yet the trajectory, right? Um, <clears throat> and other, another very interesting thing is that commercial providers just give you how long it takes driving from A to B. For matching purposes, what I actually want to know is, now, is like, if I offer a ride to a driver who is in a certain uh, location now, moving in this speed, how long will it take for him to pick up a passenger in here? And it sounds like the same problem, but it's not exactly the same. Because if that driver 
on average, our driver ten, takes like 15 seconds to accept the journey. In those 15 seconds, maybe he has uh, already missed the exit or gone in a tunnel, and then that, that, that is like a different problem. Um, so this is just an idea of how did we build the experimental setup. Uh, we got some, a few millions of, of journeys. Um, and we made like a vanilla model, which was like, yeah, from A to B, we compute the straight distance and how long it took the model and stuff like that as a target. And all of a, uh, to surprise or of no one, the model performs really bad, right? And then it comes the magic. The magic consists of like, uh, for a journey, we not only we don't have all information about pickup and drop off. We also have the trajectory. That trajectory, we can map it in cells. This is, has anyone here heard of any kind of geohashing? So, geohashing is typically with squares. This, uh, for this, we use hexagons. If you have ever heard of S2, which is the typical Google uh, back. Geohashing, this is H3, which is similar, but with hexagons. But basically, it's uh, uh, some bytes that will define themselves a region in the world, in this case, an hexagon. Um, the, which is good. Like, yeah, in there we have more information. But what happens is like uh, there are like literally millions of these cells. If, and if we do one hot encoding and we put it in a machine learning system, we are learning nothing. And then is the magic. We realize that the cells in a journey behave statistically similar to words in sentences. In two sense. One is that uh, the distribution is a C flow. In the language, you have common words. Imagine the word why. And in mobility, you have transportation hubs. Imagine train stations or airports. And also, we realized that there is also the, phen the, phenomenon, the phenomena of co-occurrence, uh, which is when you see in a text Madrid is often close to city, just like cells in a road, if, you are uh, if we follow our trajectories, then they, they tend to follow roads, right? So given, a, and then there are crossings, and so it was a crazy idea that proposed by one of the members of my team. I have to, te to honestly say that I gave it like no credit. Like, yeah, you can spend one week with that, but you, you will get nowhere. And the crazy idea was like, what if we consider that these are a phrase and then we use the natural language process well-known techniques, such as word to back. And um, what we are actually doing in a more mathematical way is sort of an embedding. We had a, something that was in, a mil, in the tens of millions dimension, and we are bringing down to only 100 dimensions. But what we are learning is basically the structure of the city by doing that. And let me, so each cell is given a number, is given a position in a lone dimension space that allows you to tell if two, if two cells are close or far away in the sense of a journey. And here is the crazy thing. This is an example cell, and these are the, the cells that are closer in the sense of a journey. As you can see, remember that the, the system never saw a map of the city in, its style, in the entire time, right? It just saw trajectories. So apparently, it learned that this is a highway, M30, if you know Madrid, probably no, that is like the most crowded highway in the city. This is another highway, and apparently the system has learned about it. And when we saw this, it was like, yeah, it was super cool, but it didn't work, right? Like, and then we went in the map, and what is happening is like there is a tunnel from here to here. GPS in the, in the tunnel doesn't work, so the deep learning has learned that this cell is close to this cell, which is pretty cool, right? Um, and the cool thing is like, if the vanilla model error was here, we are already hitting this, this being the gold standard, being Google real-time predictions, 
Google being a company that has spent over a billion dollars in building maps, throwing uh, literally cars on the street with cameras and tracking all Android devices in the world. And I mean, we, we are not better than Google. That, that would be like, we, we are doing something weird, uh, but we are pretty close enough, right? Uh, and this is just an example of like how it learns that the daily pulse of a city, this is the weekend for a certain route, and this is the rush hour in, in every day, how both Google and our deep learning have learned that this happened, right? Uh, we, uh, as I explained before, we also wanted the isochrones because of the, of the problem that I mentioned before of scalability in the dispatching. And as you see here, the, when we produce isochrones uh, with the deep learning, it basically captures the pulse of the city. So you can see down, like uh, 12 uh, p.m., how everything becomes closer because it is the rush hour in UTC. And I, this is super useful for us because commercial APIs are, are not providing this kind. I mean, some of them claim that they provide, but if you say how much does it cost, it tells you, it depends on the matrix, of the underlying matrix. Uh, yeah, I'm still with the square, uh, with the square cost problem. Uh, just a soup of logos of where we have used uh, to, to do this. We were pretty happy about experimenting with H2O, by the way, although going to production with us is like freaking expensive. We don't know what we will do about it. Um, and yeah, we have used these technologies, but uh, this is what we want to hit. The, the deep learning system is not yet in production, but we know what we want the system to perform, which is like, yeah, it has to be up. It has to support 100,000 requests in a second. The accuracy has to be less than 10% error on the duration of the journey. And it should be able to retrain itself, uh, considering that we might do 1,000 journeys in the last minute, right? So it's quite a challenge, right? And then it comes on the why we are here as speakers. and also going around. Our, the, I really love the previous speaker in the morning that mentioned the Atlas and the heavy lifting, so I completely stole the idea. Is, is, is he around? No. Thank you anyway. Uh, right now, we have four engineers and seven data engineers and seven DBAs. We have eight data scientists. And because Cabify has been a mostly local operations company until now, uh, we have a bunch of data analysts, tens of business analysts that also run queries on our data warehouse. And this figure is quite impressive. Like every day, over 700 people log in in our Tableau system and try to, gather, to make sense of, of, some, of some data. Uh, and the cool thing is like we, you can work for us from Brazil, which is always something that people might consider. Uh, so the idea is like we want to triple the number of data engineers and double the number of data scientists for the uh, next year, and we are hiding. So this is me, and the, the other is Alberto, who is sitting over there on a red shirt. He's the head of data engineer. And as you can see, we have uh, plenty of challenges. We think there is a lot of talent in, in this conference, uh, or maybe people that you know and might be uh, interested, and the other thing is like, I don't know if you heard of not. If you didn't hear, it's like because you have been hiding somewhere because it's been all over TV for the entire three days. Uh, because of political fights and weird stuff, we are, we are giving away free rights for everyone today in Barcelona, Madrid, Sevilla, Alicante, and Valencia. So, so maybe our matcher will find a car for you. Obviously today, demand exceeds supply. So you have like a 20% chance of, of, of getting a ride, but still it's worth testing the, uh, the service. Yeah, and that would be all. Hello, uh, thank you. It was very interesting. Uh, I have two questions for you. Um, first, uh, about uh, uh, the two algorithm, the search calculator and the matching system. Could you tell us about, uh, about the stack and the architecture behind them? 
and uh, I don't know more, more globally, uh, do you have a framework to to uh, develop tests, maybe A-B test, uh, this kind of uh, algorithm? Yeah, actually building the, the ability to be able to A-B test things as complex and critical and as critical as the, as the matcher is something that it took, it took me personally. I was the first data scientist at Cabify. A bunch of efforts and a lot of convincing with developers that it was worth it. Uh, so basically now in Cabify, I would say like over 80% of the, of the platform microservices allow us for fine grain A-B tests. This means literally I can create a cohort of users by user ID and apply them a certain treatment, whether it is price, discounts, dispatching strategies, or those. And those are being built as part of the feature set of the microservice, right? So now when you ask the, the squad that is uh, using the matcher, what are the features that you have to provide to the, to the company, they will not only talk about dispatching rights, but they will also mention, and we have to be able to A-B test in these two, we have typically, in that case for the matcher, used two experimental settings that were designed by the data science team. And even more important than that is that I don't think there is a company with, I mean, okay, a company, a startup with five people, maybe, but there is no unicorn in the world with the risk appetite Cabify has for these things. For, I, I'm telling you the nice parts in here, but while trying to improve the matcher, once uh, we uh, broke everything, uh, Basically, you, when you order, you might order a, an executive vehicle or a regular vehicle or even a, moto, a, a motorbike for delivery. So, yes, it happened to us that we deployed with a bug and suddenly uh, motorbikes started to arrive to customers that had requested an executive vehicle. But nothing happened. We fixed it within one hour and there was like literally no sort of retaliation for any top management. I was like, ah, these things happen. Okay, thank you. And the second question, uh, about the, the matching system, you are using uh, uh, the ETA to, to match the driver and the user. Uh, did you consider uh, other variable, other information? Uh, I don't know, uh, optimize the uh, utility or something else? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm just explaining here something that was my point in this talk is like we could do simple things with high impact. We have done already more complicated things just to give you an idea. Uh, if you are taking a ride that will take one hour and a half as a, as a driver, you don't mind to drive for 10 minutes to pick up. However, if it's a seven minutes ride, you will be super angry if you are assigned a pickup 10 minutes, right? So that's, that's like cost per hour uh, in dollars that uh, the whole the whole journey has is being factored as a as an attractiveness of of the thing, or also we do because of the dynamic pricing system we have the scarcity detection, so we favor journeys whose destination is in a, is in an area where there is a scarcity where we are lacking cars. Uh, yeah, I mean as uh, actually the, the I want really to thank the previous speaker because he basically explained. Well, I validated my roadmap for the next two years. That's exactly what we are building. And, and explain some of the problems. Like if you, if these are good as first steps, but then uh, the matching system, the matching problem is multivariate. You may optimize different things. Uh, especially if get, we haven't run into that because somehow we have uh, teach our drivers to accept our journeys. But for most right-hailing companies in the world, the acceptance of the driver is also an, a source of uncertainty. So it's completely different if you want to optimize for having a driver as soon as possible assigned than if you want to optimize, as we do, for productivity of the driver, right? So it's a multivariate system that depends probably on the, on the market settings and the kind of relationship that you have with your, with your agents in the, in the marketplace. And in the end, let's be honest, like probably our tech is behind our competitors. You know, the, we have, a, 
less than 200 engineers. Some of them have 5,000. But we think we can understand better the local problems. And as well as the previous speaker was mentioning traffic in Indonesia, we have a very big issue with personal safety in Latin America, right? And it completely flips, uh, flips the, the view. Uh, in Latin America, uh, you have to protect the driver. If you just throw a person with a bunch of cash, uh, it's like an ATM with wheels that will come and you can do whatever you want to him. And tackling all those local things that change everything is where we think we can find our competitive advantage.